Hello everyone, this is Jamie Thomas. Welcome to the first episode of my podcast, The Thrill of It All. The idea of this podcast is to discuss the inspiration and journey of individuals that I admire and respect. This first episode, my guest is Chad Muska. Chad, welcome to the show. You're the first guest. Is it official? Are we starting? <laughs> it's official, we're starting. <laughs> we've, bro we've broken the ice. We've broken the ice. Jamie, good to see you, my friend. Yeah, thanks for uh, coming on the show and being the first guest. Um, I wanted Chad to be the first guest because Every time I talk to Chad on the phone, we always have these amazing conversations that are really inspirational. And I leave, I get off the phone, and I'm just super psyched and motivated to do something. And um, I always wish that I would have recorded the conversation. So I thought that um, we could record a conversation and everyone could hear what we talk about. So how are you? I'm doing excellent, my friend. How about yourself? <laughs> I'm really good. I'm a little bit nervous. This is new for me, um, taking the plunge into podcasting and... Uh, it's hard. It's weird doing something like later in life and trying this new stuff that you're not really that comfortable in. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Hopefully, well, we don't from the outside out. looking in, like I mean, you've always created things. You've always done these things and uh, documented and edited and brought people together and and inspired people. Is, and that's what you've done. And I know that you're saying that you're connecting with people that are here to do. Uh, that inspired you or respect in this journey and stuff. And I feel the same exact about you. And so I think it's a, it's an honor to be here on your show and to uh, kick it off, you know? And I think that uh, we'll make it easy. We're getting the hard way out of the part in the beginning, <laughs> the hard, hard part out in the beginning. And, and uh, you know, um, I think it'll start to flow. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again. Um, as most of you know, Chad and I have a long history of skating together. Um, we started working together in the 95 or so, met each other and started skating around Pacific Beach, Mission Beach, started filming each other before we rode for the same brand. And then um, I asked Chad to ride for Toy Machine with Ed Templeton's blessing and he did and we had an amazing few years uh, working on Welcome to Hell together. And um, from there, things you know we kind of went our separate ways and came back in touch or got back in touch and then worked on circuit together and traveled together and um, it's kind of been like we've been in and out of each other's lives but there's always been this um, high level of mutual respect I think um, for one another and I feel like it would be you know Chad you're the per per perfect person to launch the show and to kind of talk about a little bit of your story and then kind of talk about how our stories I don't know came together and um, I guess I'd like to start a little bit by, um, you know, I've seen, we've seen your Epically Later and we've seen interviews and stuff, you know, and there was basically this pivotal moment where you decided that, you know, you've been arrested for graffiti and stuff. And there's this pivotal moment where you decided that you felt like you wanted more and there was more, more destined for your life. Like, can you talk a little bit about that kind of epiphany and that turning point of you realizing that you didn't want to be like a derelict that was in juvie, you wanted to like make something yourself? I think like that, that feeling was always with me as a youth. Like I always like felt like I was in the wrong place as a kid, like growing up and kind of felt out of place at, at high school or with my, in my neighborhood and stuff. I just kind of remember being like, you know. Was that before you started skating or, or even uh, after? Even a, it's, it's really, you know, looking back on childhood, it's like, it's hard, you know, like, yeah. because I've, so much has happened in between yeah, that yeah. it's, it's a bit cloudy and there's only bits and pieces of memories and stuff. But, you know, when I really start to like come into memory of, of my life and involving and everything comes from skateboarding, that's, that was the, the start of it, you know, and that's where I think I started to find myself of uh, who I was before that I was like, you know, just a kid and in sixth grade and yeah, just, just being a normal things. kid and, you know, yeah. listening to music, MTV, whatever was going on at that time, you know? And so, yeah. um, you know, skateboarding was really the start, at least, of, and even the, the beginning of where my memory starts now of, of like who I am today. And, um, you know, and I just, I just remember having this feeling that something wasn't all the way right and that the cards that were dealt to me weren't going to be my final cards. You know, I, I didn't want to stay, um, I dropped out of high school at an early age and left everything because I just felt that it was wrong. I didn't feel like the educational system that I was in at that time was nurturing me in any way that was positive and preparing me to do 
um, something more and to reach my full potential. So right. skateboarding kind of, you know, was that spark, I think, though, where, where I was skating. And, and, but there was that pivotal, pivotal point at, in Vegas. I was living there. You know, I was like in a trailer park with my mom and I was, uh, I had broken my ankle pretty bad and, and, uh, had, yeah, yeah, I had metal plates put in and there was almost a time before that. It's so, it's crazy. Cause I'm like, my memories are a little bit all over the place. And so, uh, the story kind of goes a bit all over the place as yeah. well too. Um, but I remember, you know, just going like, I, you know, always thinking this, that there, I want to go to California, you know, and I, and my mom had told me, uh, you know, uh, not too long ago, and I didn't remember this, but she was like, you know, yeah, when you were like, first started skating at 12 years old, you were like, you're, you would always say, I'm moving to Santa Monica, California, and I'm gonna get sponsored, and I'm gonna wow, uh, so like, live in California. Like, that, and I didn't remember even having that, that right. conversation necessarily, you know? Um, so when you went to California, was your sole purpose to make a life in skateboarding, or was it just to live the California dream? Well, I, I wanted to make it in skateboarding, but when I first came to California, I had broke my ankle so bad, I was still recovering from that. Right. So I had the metal pins in my ankle and I was on a cane and I was really into graffiti at that time. Um, and I knew some kids in, in uh, San Diego that were doing into the graffiti scene and, uh, and I was just, I wanted to make it in skateboarding, but at that point I was like, I didn't, I didn't know if that was a, a possibility or not yeah, because yeah. of my ankle. You know, I was like, it was like bad, bad. You know, yeah, at, yeah. At that I remember time. when we first met, it was like a popular just, discussion. It was just, yeah. It was like when we first met, I was just getting to the point where I started filming that maple video stuff. Yeah, um, and I remember and, you talking about it though. Like, when you'd try a trick and your board would hit you in the ankle and it would freak you out because you were still that, really cautious of yeah. the of that injury it was, it was still pretty it was new. traumatizing to yeah. me you know when yeah, it yeah. happened because uh i was getting hooked up by gene mabel hadn't even uh been formed yet when i first broke it it was gene s it was and it was gene yeah. s turned into and and yeah. i was getting hooked up with and and they were like um they had sent me out to one contest in northern california somewhere um and um uh when i went up there that sparked a lot for me too. You know, I was yeah. like, whoa, I seen all the pros. I was skating by them and I got really excited, you know, and then I went back to Vegas and I was skating a lot and there was some other contest coming up or something and I was skating my local park. So how did you actually break your ankle? It was, I was the night before, I think it was like a few nights before I was supposed to go to California even right. for this. They were going to send me out and everything and I was so excited. Um, and then there was this place rock solid. It was this like crazy, like Christian, like uh, halfway house skate center like youth yeah. center kind of yeah, place yeah, yeah. they had all kinds of basketball and different things and they had this thing it was a cool place i met so many cool people friends from that place and everything but they had this big vert wall and i remember i had these like shoes i got at like uh you know some random place but they had a very thick sole like real thick like uh like tall you know yeah and i think they were like diodoras or something but they looked yeah. cool i liked them and yeah. and i was skating in them and I went up this vert wall. I was doing like alley kick flips on this vert wall. Like, wait, it was a really long, mellow, like, 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 uh, wall and I was going up and I had these on lock. I was doing these alley -oop kick flips like way up it. Like it just felt I, like I dreaming. wish I could still do that back. Yeah. <laughs> I remember doing that, you know. And then one time I missed it and I and I kicked the board out and my my ankle landed on the vert wall flat and it and it buckled, you know? And so the, 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 the sole stayed on the vert and then it rolled and my ankle rolled on top of my foot. Yeah. And I basically slid, my, my leg broke and went on top of my foot and slid down on Gnarly. my foot, you know? And I was like, got up and was like my, you know, my foot was sideways. Like the yeah. whole bones, all the bones broke basically and went that way. And I was like, oh my God, you know? And then my friend Devin, Got, I was like, you know, they're call an ambulance. I was like, I can't go in the ambulance. You know what I mean? Take me home. And so yeah. got my homie Devin's car. We drove back to my house and, and, and uh, my mom, I remember came out and was like, thought I had been shot because I was in the back seat. And yeah, I was like, yeah. you gotta come out, you know? And yeah. I was like laying in the back seat and she was freaking out and stuff. And, and so th that was, yeah, at that place, that's when I broke my ankle. Then everything kind of just stopped, you know? Yeah. And I, and I wasn't, anything or far enough in a connection with these brands that, that they were like, okay, well, you know, here's, we're going to keep taking care of you or anything. It was like, call us, call us when your ankle's better, you know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. at You're that still point, in the beginning of my, my dreams were pretty much shattered, you yeah. know? I'm like, it's a wrap. I'm done. Like, 
I'm going to go get a job. I'm going to work, keep working what I'm doing in the precast, making concrete. Um, yeah, uh, I was going to say, what were you doing? You're working uh, already. I work with my mom's boyfriend. Um, he he, uh, there's a concrete a concrete casting um, place in the desert, mm -hmm. and he drove the the big rig trucks. And I would go. They would make the the concrete. They were anything from those little water ones, you know, like yeah. they say water on them, like the little uh, the metal lid goes on the yeah, thing, yeah, and you yeah. see them in the ground everywhere. And then they made super huge ones that would like house electrical uh, things underneath Vegas or something. And so they made the concrete structures there. And then my job was to uh, patch all the corners because when they came out of the mold, some of the corners would be chip off and break. Wow, so that's cool that you got it's like pretty, concrete. It's, <laughs> it's pretty funny, concrete yeah. Experience. It's a came full circle for me, yeah. kind of. Um, and so I'd patch the corners and then I would pack um, all these like cement things on crates and then shrink wrap them and then forklift them onto the trucks. Wow. And so then, um, that's kind then, of a lot of responsibility. How old were you at this time? Like 15, 16? Yeah, 16 and 15, I think. Yeah. 15, I think I was, yeah. Um, I dropped out of high school already um, and was living in a trailer park with my mom in Vegas and her boyfriend. And It took you like maybe six months or so to get the ankle going again where you started skating a little bit? Well, I didn't start skating yet. It was about six months um, after that that it was it was good enough to then walk, you know, and oh, I had really? a cane yeah, and yeah, I was yeah. walking, but I still wasn't skating. And that's when I was still heavily... In, I turned to graffiti more at that time because I didn't have skating, I think, you know, and so I was doing more graffiti. And then I started to get in trouble in Vegas and got busted, I think three times it was, and then was facing all this like, you know, community service and juvenile time and fines. And that was definitely the point where I was like, you know, I got to get out of here. Yeah. I have to get out of here. Um, Do you think that, that Vegas for, for some teens, especially if you're not growing up with like structured lives, you think that that you know, is a place where that happens kind of often, or you think that it happens anywhere? The feeling of wanting to get out of there or no, bad things Just Vegas, kids. I don't know, it just seems yeah, I think, like. I think, I think it definitely was like um, an adult driven town, you know, yeah. everything's about the strip, you know, yeah. it, you, in Vegas, it's like everybody, at least for the, the uh, lower income community, you know. Yeah, was, I know that soccer, they have like these crazy soccer fields and they have a lot of organized sports stuff, but it, you know, if, you're not, think, if you're not plugged into that, then yeah, it's kind of like I, what your electrical devices. I think that devices. now it's probably changed a lot more and there's yeah, more yeah. for kids there. But at that time, it was definitely, at least for myself, it felt like there was not a lot there for, for me um, besides this group of friends that I had attached to and, um, yeah. and been able to uh, make great friends with. And they sort of took me in. And that was Paul Smith and Paul Morris and uh, my friend Lonnie Marsh and Anthony Carr. Um, and, and these Were those guys, guys like your first inspiration that you remember, like wanting to look up to someone and be like someone, those guys? I, or well, was it like, maybe, was there maybe, anything it, outside Maybe it was an unintentional wanting to be like that, you know, because yeah. for me it was always like, I, the first time I remember like wanting to like be like something was more in Arizona and it was like. That these, was before this? Yeah, okay. it was before going to Vegas and it was more like these kind of like Vato dudes and like, you know, like they're like cool and had tattoos and, you know, and, and they were like, you know, had like flannels on and like, you know, so I thought that was cool. You know, that yeah. was the first thing where I was like, that's pretty cool. Like, you know, like yeah. that I remember really, but, but then those, so I, I had already like, as for as young as I was, I was already kind of like developed in Phoenix, and then um, it, you know hanging with like a whole skate crew out there. And there so was a started, solid. So you started skating in Phoenix in Arizona, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was in Phoenix. My, it's the story is like so long. Yeah, but your dad, so, your dad lived in Phoenix. Your mom he, lived in Vegas. Yeah, but yeah. first, my my dad lived in Phoenix, and my mom lived in um, Philadelphia, oh, and okay. in and in Jersey, and all we were all over the East Coast yeah. over there. And then they got back together in Arizona, and that's when I first moved to Arizona, and then was introduced to skateboarding through some uh, kids in the neighborhood that had launch ramps, and uh, there was empty that's pool. A, that was a sick time. Launch there was ramps empty were fun. pool. <laughs> yeah. So we had these, you know, like there was all these skaters in Arizona and I got turned on to it from there. And then um, the skate scene was pretty huge in, in, uh, in, I think in Vegas and Arizona at that time, there was both huge skate scenes. And um, so you just like, when you left your dad's in Phoenix and moved to your mom's in Vegas, you just unplugged from one skate scene and plugged into the other. So my mom lived in this apartment complex and uh, I would just move, that's where she lived. And so I'm skating, I would go in the parking lot to skate in the apartment complex. And one day I see this group, this car pull up and like all these like cool dudes get out and they had skateboards. And I was like, wow, like 
look at these dudes, you know? And then they like had girls and they would go in this house. And then so I would just kind of watch them all the time. And then eventually I just kept skating in front of their house, you know? I would just like, <laughs> and whenever I saw them, I would try to like bust my tricks and, yeah, yeah. you know, and I, cause I knew they skated, but they were like, they were older and, and uh, yeah. they but you were, wanted like, to like strike up a conversation. Yeah, yeah. And, like, and so finally somehow, I don't know how, I ended up meeting them and then like, that was Paul Morris and Paul Smith and, oh, really? and, and Lonnie. That's who lived in that place. Oh, wow, that's and, sick. And then I was like, whoa, Paul Smith is pro. He's sponsored. And like, yeah. I was like, oh my God. Like, you know, because none of my friends in, in Arizona, like I had seen Randy Colvin and Colby Carter and Chris Livingston and yeah, um, all the Arizona uh, all guys. The, all, Matt yeah. Schneer and all these OG guys. Um, but I was never really like friends with them. They were like, you know, the sponsored guys and, yeah. and they didn't really like interact with us much back then. You know, yeah. we were kind of the derelicts, like the, dirt bag, just little skate rat kids, you know? Yeah. And, and so um, when I got to like meet these guys and then like they kind of took me in, they were kind of like, this kid's funny, you know? Or so yeah. I was, kind of became their little mascot, you know? Yeah, yeah. And like uh, you're the kid they would put up to try things or like you'd be the guy to test stuff out or yeah. whatever. And yeah, and then so that was the initial meeting and I got to spend, you know, some time skating with them. And, and when things got hectic with my mom, I would eventually go back to live with my dad. And then, you know, I was on this, Kind of you know, you get mad forth. at me, I'm going to mom. You mad, yeah. mad, mom, you yeah. mad at me, I'm going to my dad's, you know? And, and so there was all this like back and forth. And when I came back the next time, they were gone. The house, they had been kicked out of the place or something. And I was like, where are these guys at? Like, I need to find them, you know? And so I went on this like mission to find them. And I'd go to the skate shops and be like, do you guys know where Paul Smith is? They're like, yeah, he was here. And you know, and all that stuff. And then I found out that they got a new apartment on the other side of town. And so I discovered that apartment and somehow, I think I just went over there or something and found it. And up, went in the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I moved in with them. I just was like, Whoa. I'm not living with my mom. I'm living with these guys, you know? And Paul, Paul Morris allowed me to stay in his room and stay there or stay on the couch. And, and so I just moved You're in with probably them. How old at this time I don't think I was still I was still like 14 or 15 I think something, really. like, something like that you know and so um, I was so, pretty bad with time frames, no it's but. all good I, I get it I mean roundabout age is, is good enough and so you got the graffiti charges and you you headed to California and that was basically you just felt like you needed to get out of there and that was the place you wanted to go I I was gonna leave Vegas at any cost yeah. I was like I would rather be homeless and working at, or, you know, working anywhere at McDonald's, whatever it was, anything, mm -hmm. but the, the life I was living at that time, yeah. I was like, I got to get out of here. And my mom was pregnant. She was just having, she had just had, um, my little sister Savannah and it was just like, things were just hectic there. It was too much, you know? And, and right. I was like becoming a man at that time. And I was like, you know, I got to go find mine, you know? Yeah, and and yeah. that's, that's what it was about. I, 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 uh, I had no expectation. I had no uh, exact vision of what was gonna happen. And, you know, at one point in my life, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be a skater and be sponsored and all this, but that was kind of, you know, washy at that time. And so I was like, you know, I just knew that like, anything was better than what I had at that point. And For so sure. even if I failed and had to come back, at least I was gonna give it a shot. Yeah. You know, that was, that was my goal at that time from what I could remember. And so I knew these girls, that were going on vacation out there and they just, you know, drove. It was just a ride. They pulled, they, they, they just ride. They drove up to Mission Beach, dropped me off. And I knew my friend Mikey worked at Hamels and he had came to Vegas one time. Yeah, I know And Mikey. I met him one time and I was like, I was like, he's like, hey, if you ever come to California, hit me up, you know? And so I, I just showed up there. I, I was like, I'm here, you know, like, what's up? And he's like, I'm working, bro. Like, you know, like, and he was working and then he would allow me to like crash at his place here and there. And then, from him, I met all the other beach yeah. kids, the graffiti kids and the, the kind of squatter kids. And Was like graffiti and kind of skateboarding your, I mean, you're a very creative person. You're known for that, like, you know, throughout your whole skateboarding career. Was that kind of like the, I don't know, the beginning of that creative outlet like graffiti and skateboarding? Like, was For that, sure. Like, at the time, I didn't realize it, you know, because like even now, like looking back, if you said anything about art or something when I was a, when I was a kid, yeah. you know, I'd be like, that sucks, you know, yeah. art's stupid, you know, like yeah. that's for losers or something. And, and, yeah. Or even like I never had never been into an art museum or a, a gallery or anything. Yeah, I thought yeah. that was like something for other people, you know, I didn't, yeah. I didn't look at graffiti as art. I looked at it as our culture and our expression, you know, yeah. and that was connected to hip hop, hip hop, yeah. break dancing. DJing, producing, yeah. skateboarding was part of that to me. It's like it's art. crazy though. What, what all those things you just mentioned, you basically have, you know, you've fostered a, 
you know, somewhat of a career and you took some time and focused on all those different disciplines. And because they were always part of my life. Yeah. And so as, <clears throat> as I, you know, skateboarding allowed me some, some freedom in life. It didn't, I didn't have to stress as much at one point after this is Absolutely. fast forwarding, you I know mean, what I, I mean? I, to, to having some sort of income and some sort of stability allowed me to go back and go, okay, these are the loves of my life and I want to express further in them and, and, yeah. uh, um, Try them That's and, awesome, and, though, just to see the origin, though, of like where they all came from, and then brought you there. Yeah, because they were they were always there. It's, some people were like, you know, I, I've seen it over the years. You know, people like, oh, Chad's producing music now, or Chad thinks he's fashion designer now, or Chad thinks he's doing art now, or you know, it's like, but it's like that's that's all I've ever done. You know, like most people. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always seen it as you exploring who you are and exploring these different sides of your creative. You but know, I think nature. people are quick to pigeonhole people as a, like, oh, you're For Jamie sure. Thomas, you're a pro skater. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. you can't do anything else but that. You really, know? Like, they, <laughs> really, they put the rules they put on themselves and they try and put them on everyone else. Yeah. I mean, that's really kind of the way it, it seems to shake out. And, and, you know, they don't really know who we are, or what we have to offer. They just think that you have the same thing they have and they're not comfortable with themselves enough to go try those things. You know, and I, I feel like that's, and people will paint a picture of you based on the information that they do have. Absolutely. You know? And, so and they, they don't want you to change either. No. They want you to continue to be what you've yeah. been to them. Yeah. yeah. And the funny thing was is they don't even realize it. If you just were always that same thing, they wouldn't care about you anymore. I know. You I know, know what I mean? Like, until, it's you, like, until you start changing, <laughs> yeah. they, don't, they don't, yeah, they're not like, they're not like supporting you every day. Yeah. They're just like, they yeah. just don't want you to change it's, because and, people don't like change. And, and I just believe that's what we're here for. We're here to express and to live and to love and to, 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 to create these things that like you feel inside your heart, you know, and, and, and everybody's purpose is very different. You know, some people will never create an art piece or ride a skateboard or, or whatever, create music, but they all, they all have their specific purpose and, and, in life. And, and that's what they're supposed to do. And I think all of us know deep down inside when we're, when we're living up to our fullest and, and, trying to express that um, yeah, when purpose we're, as when much we're as possible. thriving and growing. Yeah, yeah, like you know, you feel great about yourself. You feel Absolutely. good, you're energized. You're like, that's when you're living out your purpose, you know? Yeah. And then we, we all get distracted and, 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 you know, go astray at times. And, but, um, you know, it's, it's all about continuing that process to never give up and keep going and keep going. Um, you know, and I, I, uh, I was talking to Brian Anderson today a bit through text. He kind of texted me about a few things. Yeah. He's like, oh, I'm kind of tripping out, this and that. And, and you know, and I was like, it's, it's, it's natural, you know. It's natural for, especially for somebody like yourself or somebody like myself or like Brian, people that have, like, uh, went given themselves so much to to the world you know like you're constantly giving yourself to people and 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 working on your expression that can hopefully inspire people in life like that 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 i feel like that's what i've done my whole life like i'm always like trying to like do these things because not only because i enjoy doing it and i love doing it but i also see that it has had an impact on people throughout my life and and that like only furthers me to like continue this it, this journey you know for and, sure and but and, and to share with the people that are following your journey 100 yeah. percent. but with that said there's these extreme highs and people see you all the time and whenever i'm in public i say oh yeah what's up oh chad's happy this that when you come back and you you have this this come down from all that those those are hard you know yeah. and, and you have these moments of like yeah. you know of of of, of self doubt questioning, am I doing things right? Am I, you know, am I doing enough or, um, you know, all these things. And I think people that do share themselves with others so much are going to have those, those downs uh, a lot more than some people, Yeah. but I, it's the ability to take that down and, and turn it into strength and power and creativity and, and out in an outlet, you know? Absolutely. I find that every video part I've ever filmed, I go into a, like a depression basically afterwards. I poured so much of myself into the video part. And to be honest, like I've always loved the, the, the making of the part. I love like the, I don't know, the puzzle of trying to put the part together and like, I kind of just never want it to end. Yeah. I know that it needs to come out and like, you know, it, it's serving a purpose because you're creating something that's like, it's marketing your brand or whatever. It's marketing yourself. There's like this, there's this bigger, you know, purpose for the video part or the video, but I always just love being in the part. I, I always want it to be better and better and better and better. And then there's just this finite time you have to film. And then whenever that timing's over, 
I, I feel like I'm, I'm just now getting into the next groove of whatever yeah. it is I'm creating. And I, I'm sure you can you know, attest to this with art and the things that you're doing. You're just always evolving. And so <clears throat> since you're evolving and you're skating and your skating's changing and it's growing, you don't want the part to end because then that means it, it kind of like it, it solidifies what you did in that time period. Yeah. And I always go into like this weird like funk after a video where I kind of don't know what to do with myself. And then I like for a couple of weeks, I wander around bumping into things. And then I realize, oh, wait, this is when you're the happiest. You just need to go dive into another project, yeah. you know. And usually I try and, you know, nowadays I don't film video parts as much as like when we were younger, you know, we we're cranking out parts every year or two. Um, you know, nowadays it's like four years. <laughs> it's been a long time since my last part, but I need a little bit longer. For <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you've had some injuries. And so, I mean, back the ankle injury was the first big injury. You know, it was the first big thing you had to go through. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, I mean, you'd had you'd have multiple injuries to come. Like, how how did you overcome? You know, and I, I I've had the same, and I, I kind of want to just hear what you, what was your process from coming back from injuries? Because I feel like this is very encouraging. Like, you know, people hit me up on Instagram, and they hit me up, and they reach out to me, and they 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 need encouragement because they're at this dark place. They've loved skateboarding so much, and it's everything to them. They've poured themselves into it, and then when they have this this injury, like you blow out your knee or you break your ankle or something like it's really hard to deal with. People like have a hard time first, like they don't know if they can skate again. And then second, they don't know what to do with themselves. Why they, while they wait, you know, um, how, how do you, how did you, how do you deal with injuries whenever you've had them? And how do you I deal think with like them in the past, like my drive to, to make my mark in skateboarding was so strong that like, uh, that's that was that was how I got through with it. You know, I just knew that it was, was all gonna about get getting better. back to skate. I just knew it was going to get better, and I knew I was going to skate again at any cost. Like you know, and yeah. and uh, it wasn't really till way later in in life that I had these injuries that were like, wait a minute, like this is this isn't just going to bounce changing. back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and so the the initial all the initial injuries were I was I remember being so frustrated that I couldn't keep skating and, and you yeah. know, film these parts or do whatever it was. Um, but just that internal drive was just there. And I was just like, you know, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. I'm going to skate. And I would always kind of utilize, like, I always had it in my head that like my power, the power of my mind could heal anything in my body. You know, like I was like with a little bit of stretching and, you know, an Epsom salt bath or something and put some tiger bomb on it and <laughs> you're good. Like, you know, wrap it up with a ace bandage and you're going to make But I mean, but the ankle, the ankle was like big, you know, you, I remember seeing you come back from that and, but you started like getting bits of taste. Like you started skating like rails again. And you started, started with small rails and you started like, you know, getting back to like where you were skating bigger rails. And I remember, you know, filming that nose slide and tail slide in Hillcrest. And it was like a 12 stair rail. And I'd never stepped to a 12 stair rail. I'd maybe caveman did or something like, you know, years before in like the Hocus Pocus days. But like I was filming you nose slide and tail slide, a, you know, 12 stair rail. And your ankle injury was, you know, you'd probably been skating for six months to a year. And it was like, that was a really quick, like, you know, once you kind of like got mentally over it and, you know, we were skating like five and seven stair rails, like the El Camino rails in Oceanside. I remember we skated those a couple times, but it was like, it was clicking. Like every week you were pushing yourself a little further, a little further, yeah. a little further. And I remember tripping at that time because you were a little younger than me and you were like so fired up. And that was when I, I remembered making like a decision of like, I want to skate with this kid more. Like he got a fire. Like I always thought that I was really driven and that I was super motivated. But when I skated with you, I, I like saw something that I didn't even see in myself. And there was also a certain level of recklessness that you had that <laughs> there was a lot of recklessness. <laughs> I know there was, but like you had like this, this energy and, and sometimes it was like, you know, it made me like uneasy. You were pumped. Like I showed up one day with a video camera. You're like, Oh, you got a video camera. Let's go. I want to no slide this rail. And I remembered it was like people were coming out of the, you know, out of the apartment complex and it was like we were waiting on it. And I just remembered it being like a, a real, you know, gnarly scene. And you just charging like 100 percent charging. Like, well, I think like looking back on it from what I remember was like, you know, I didn't have a lot of opportunity. You know what I mean? The opportunity didn't present itself to me much at that time, you know? Yeah. And I remember meeting you felt like an opportunity, you know? And I was like, Jamie, and because you were relatively still 
new, new but uh, yeah, at least I mean, had a you, board. You were already like solidified yeah. in, in, in a lot of ways, obviously, you know, because yeah. I had already seen interviews of you in magazines and, and all that stuff. And, and I was like, when you came out, I was like, this dude's crazy. He's like jumping all these gaps and like flying out of nowhere. And he has like bleach crazy hair and like going over rooftops. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I remember like you stood out at that time. And, and that was a, I think that was a pivotal time in skateboarding in general, you know? And so I had already respected you and looked up to you and then I, and then you had somehow made it to that house. I don't even remember how you got to that house or what. Ka- Kayla's <laughs> met, Kayla's met the crew down there and. Didn't somebody like steal your CDs or something? It was or? the craziest story Something ever. crazy like that. Yeah, no, it was really <laughs> weird. So I had this like, I had this planner, I had this planner and then I had these CDs and these CDs like music, I was always really into music, but I had spent probably like at the time, like a 500 bucks to a grand on the CD case with like all the CDs in there was so much money in CDs, like 200 CDs or something. Anyway, I, I thought it was on the like bumper of my car or like it disappeared. And then I, no, it disappeared and I thought I left it on the bumper of my car. And then when I went down to that house to meet you and some of the other crew, I like got out of my car and this was like maybe a, two days later after it went missing. Um, I got to that house in Hillcrest and like I got out of my car and then like all this paper blew up onto my tire of my car and I was like, oh, that's weird. It looks just like the paper from my planner. And I reached down and grabbed one of the pieces of paper and it was my handwriting. Oh shit. It was just in the gutter yeah, in yeah. front of your guys' house. And I was like, dude, <laughs> and, I, and I didn't know who did it or whatever. And I remember, I remember going in and going, hey, did, did someone like, did someone find this? Or did someone, does anyone know if anybody stole this? And everybody's like, you're trying to steal me, accusing me of stealing my thing. I was like, I don't know what the thing, man. How crazy is this story? I something sketchy happened. Yeah, I was like, how crazy is this story? And I told everybody. I don't everybody, think I haven't even met you yet then. Yeah. Because you like, because I just remember you saw the, I wasn't there or something. And you like came first and saw it, I think. And I think like, you're right. I came like, in there. Jamie saw your video. And I was like, what? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I was so mad I wasn't there. I remember, like, I was so bummed. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing, seeing your part. They showed it to me. I think Grimy was there at the time or something. Probably, yeah. yeah. And um, it was all these dudes from Phoenix, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah Arizona heads. Anyway. Um, those are my old school, like, first skater homies that, like, before, before Vegas, like, those guys that came out, had that yeah. house. That's a, that, that's a documentary in itself, that one house. <laughs> anyway, they showed me the tape, and I just remembered. I remember the front side pop over the Roosevelt Rail into the bank, and there was just some other stuff, and I was just, like, tripping on it. Like, whoa. And then... You, you told somebody, like, you want to skate or something, I Yeah, think. yeah, you came in, and... You, you were, I don't know, it was kind of an interesting, interesting experience, but we didn't, we weren't really able to like connect or click. So it was like, Hey, let's just go skate someday or something. Yeah. And then we went skating. And then was that, was the first time that we really session, was that that night with like Markovich downtown and we're skating that rail, that real skinny thin rail, or was that later? In, that in was our, later because okay. I think you might even have been on a toy board that, oh, okay, that, maybe, that time. Yeah, yeah I, that, that, the Horton Plaza rail, that rail was fun. Man. Yeah. Yeah. You I only got I, like 10 goes and you're kicked out. Th- those spots were the best because you just had to just jump on your thing. Just do your stuff. You know? I remember skating it because yeah it was like you and Mark which were skating and I think they were shooting you you guys but I, I think I had skated down from Hillcrest and somehow rolled up or something it might have been then that might have been the session guys, you know yeah. but it, 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 I can't remember exactly but I remember and I just remember yeah, he had, had like a front my, side board side fakie in the magazine yeah I remember that. and I remember I had like my hood on and I was like skating up and I think yeah. I started hitting the, and you, you were getting blinded by that you yeah. know but but that's like some of the first kind of sessions I remember you know and, and um mm-hmm. and and yeah I just remember like being inspired by by you and how you like were, had such a vision too and you were like okay like I'm gonna like document this and get these cameras and and film these guys and I'm gonna have my other friend film me and you know and like yeah. you, you were very self-sufficient and and like I had to be self-sufficient my whole life because I had nobody to turn to you know yeah. and so I remember identifying with that and and um and being inspired by it and and just instantly going like wow, like he has a car and he can get cameras and he knows the, the photographers and, and it, not in a way where I was like, I yeah, want to no. leech onto you and, no, and, no. And, and, and do it. But I was like, this is, that's what I want to do too. You know, yeah. I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And, and I saw that. I saw your just, you know, honest, like desire to not, not necessarily prove yourself, but to skate and push yourself. And I think that you know, for me, that, that kind of was like, I was trying to find my groove. Like, I was obviously trying to nurture and develop my own personal career. But I also knew that when I got to Toy Machine, you know, Ed, Ed asked me to ride for Toy Machine. And there was like a couple of AMs on the team and a couple of Flow Kids. And it wasn't really a team mm-hmm. at the time, you know. So he was like, yeah, I want you to like, you know, if, you know, I hear you, you know how to film or you know how to do this. Like, you can do whatever you want to do if you want to help build a team. And, you know, Ed was a little bit like, you know, kind of a little hands off. And he was like letting me 
you know, drive. And I was like, whoa, all right, sick. And, you know, I recruited Kalis and, you know, called up Josh and was like, hey, I'm, I'm riding for Toy Machine, it's sick. Ed's letting us do whatever we want. We're working on a video, you know, and I remembered we were, we were working on that video, you know, with Josh and skating with you more and more. And, um, that little red car, remember that little yeah, red yeah, car? Yeah, yeah, my Suzu I mark. <laughs> yeah. I bought that for my aunt and uncle, like from money I saved up working at Burger King. But my, my mom was really supportive. Like she helped me buy my first video camera. And you know, I bought a, I bought a video camera at like 15 or 16 at Sears. She put it on like her Sears card and made like $35 payments a month. And I was, I was conscious that she was helping me out and supporting me, but it, it did. It helped me nurture from a younger age, like filming my friends and you know, we were making little videos. Like, yeah, right, yeah, right, you had all this crazy. Yeah, right. Skating right. naked in, in, yeah, in yeah. Alabama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just stuff. <laughs> anyway, we were making videos, and I'd been making videos for a couple of years. So when you know, when I got we'll to that one. No. no, it's all right. Okay. I don't, it's in my it's in my nine club. I know you didn't see the nine club interview, but it goes really into detail on the naked. I gotta watch that video. one. I haven't seen anybody's yet, but yeah. I'm gonna watch that. Nine um, club, you're next. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> um, up, I anyway, yeah, I um, I. Uh, I don't know, I started filming and I really enjoyed that process almost just as much as skating itself because what it meant to me was is that I was able to be involved with more tricks than just what I was doing. You know, I was like help, part responsible for helping making them make them happen. And that it gave me a certain yeah, sense and, and of Yeah, and that's something that you've always carried with you. Yeah, to yeah, this day. it gave like, me a, like it gave me that. a sense of involvement even though you know, I don't have to be the dude doing it all the time, you know, and I I got, you know, really into it, you know, the start of it was kind of then, I was really fostering it and trying to understand how to film and learn. Um, I really didn't know what I was doing and even Welcome to Hell, some of the stuff I, I filmed in there, I'm just like, what was I thinking? But, you know, I was exploring it and I, just like this podcast, I didn't know what I was doing, you know, I was just doing it, I was trying it mm -hmm. and it'll evolve, it'll get better, you know, and I, I just kind of kept telling myself that, but at the time I didn't even know what to look for, so I didn't even know the footage was good or bad. I was just like, well, we got it. Yeah, you know, if got you got it. Out, I mean, yeah, we got compared to some of the footage back in the day, though. Totally. I, and think, then, you, I think you were doing pretty good. Yeah, man. and as that, as that, like, Welcome to Hell started evolving, you know, like, I started kind of getting a better understanding for the way things should look with music and stuff. And, um, yeah, man, I, I know that, uh, so you, back to injuries, you said that you, your drive, and then later in life, you know, you said that some of these injuries you, you felt like were going to be, you know, hanging around. Like, how do you deal with that? Is it just basically like, I mean, what I do is I unplug and I plug into something totally different. I just pour my life into something else. Yeah. I can pour my life into other projects that are non, sometimes they're skate related or sometimes they're business or sometimes they're whatever. But is that kind of what, yeah, has yeah. what fostered some of your other creative, you know, expressions? Or For is sure. That, like, cause they're like, I've always had those other interests in my life, you know, that were a major part of, a major influence on me as a person through the hip hop culture and, and uh, graffiti and all those things and, and design, graphic design. I have all these interests. None of them will replace a skateboard ever, yeah. you know, like, but I, luckily I had those things because yeah. a lot of skaters don't, you know, they, they get an ankle injury and they're like, what do I do, you know, and they're freaking out and playing video games or something, you know, and, and, uh, and for me, I was like, okay, I have to make usage of this time regardless. And so I'd always found ways to, to uh, explore different uh, uh, areas. In the of beginning, it was, it, was, it was painting, music. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, first it kind of started with like companies, you know, okay. I think that yeah, was yeah. first, yeah. you know. Uh, and, so it was like, and so you, one, and there, was, there was an artistic expression with it. TSA was really the first uh, oh, taste right. that I got at being mm -hmm. like a part of something where I felt like I can help creative direct and, yeah. and make logos and design clothing and uh, talk about the team and, and I remember you know, the first person I saw on those like denim cargos. Remember the ones that, <laughs> that TSA made? I was like, we don't got to remind me of no, okay, no. <laughs> no, those are dope. I got them downstairs still, don't really? you? No. <laughs> not the, not on the TSA ones, but I had some denim cargos down there. Yeah. But so TSA was like, that, I think that was the first outlet I had outside of skateboarding. And I really did learn a lot of that from you was, and from Ed as well too. Cause and that's I when you started developing your own look too. Cause before that you kind of just wore whatever you were given, right? Yeah. You, TSA was like the time where you started like cultivating like how you wanted to be mm -hmm. 
You I know. mean, I'd like to think I always had some sort of my own experience. Yeah, it was, like Dick, it was like Dickies, though. Dickies and like, white t-shirt and a backpack. Yeah. But still, to me, that was like yeah, representing right. something specifically, yeah. you know. And I that kind, of, kind of, stayed, kind of stayed true to that, you know. Yeah. And that's that kind of Vato influence and, you know, uh, like this. And, and even like that, like It's kind of like desert skate, skate rat. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. you know. Sammy Baca. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that style kind of, you know. And, and uh, that's what we all were, you know. We I were, thought it was dope, too. I remember, you know, seeing how simple everything was. Like, you really... Everything you owned was on your person. Like you had a backpack, had you backpack, had a white, had t- white t-shirt, khaki dickies, <laughs> hat slightly sideways, maybe a windbreaker. Yeah. And that was like your kit or a hoodie. I got that tongue machine, the purple tongue machine, or like that maroon windbreaker. I think yeah, it was a yeah, it was, a, it was a that burgundy was my main one. one. <laughs> yeah, burgundy that. one. that's that one in, uh, in uh, Oklahoma City. Yeah. You found that laundry three flip and then crooked around the hubba. That was like some serious like flair for back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the jacket was going everywhere. I remember you were hyped on it. But yeah, we like, you know, cause we, you know, just didn't have much and then you didn't need much at the beach. So it was pretty warm and stuff. So you yeah. didn't have to have all these things. And, but yeah, from TSA, it's the first injuries and all that stuff, I would be like, okay, well, I want to be a businessman. I started to think this way, you know, yeah. like, like, or not necessarily a businessman, but I wanted to like be a part of you want to be those, an entrepreneur. those things. Yeah. And, and any, and I liked the idea of anything that had my name associated with it, that I actually had an involvement with it. And somebody wasn't just handing me, uh, uh my look or my graphic or anything yeah. like that. Like I wanted it to be a true representation of myself. And so some of that extra time allowed me to focus more on the companies, but then that led to me to go, okay, well, what am I going to put on these skateboards? What am I going to put on these t-shirts? And that kind of brought me back to my graffiti days. And I was like, well, maybe we could write the word like this or do a a graffiti style piece and it would look cool, you know? And so that was the first start of like combining the two a bit. And then, you know, I got introduced to computers through Angel uh, and Angel got his, had a computer and he had an old one. And I was like, let me get that laptop, you know? And I got it and I was like trying to learn how to use and I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And then I remember my homeboy, Long Beach Larry, was doing this. He wanted to do a demo in Long Beach. And I was like, I'm going to make the flyer, you know? And, and so Is I, that your first project? Yeah, yeah. So, so I like busted out this flyer. Do I don't that know flyer? where it's at, man. I wish I had it. I don't know what the heck happened to that right. thing. You guys oh. got to imagine what it looks like. It was dope. I've got to find it. So, so Larry threw the demo and we made this flyer and we you know, brought the ramps out. And we all skated. And I was like, yeah, like I made this thing, you know, it reminded me of a magazine or a layout, you know, and so that really got me interested. And then, and then I was like, you know, I wanted to make work on TSA logos and make those and, um, t-shirt graphics, all that stuff. And so that, that's where it started to kind of like blend the business and the creativity started to kind of interconnect a bit at that time. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it sparked, it got me hyped. I was like, had a great feeling from creating these things. And then, yeah, I mean, it seemed like it kind of almost manifested in your skating too. Like you got more stoked on skating because you felt, like you said earlier, you felt good about how you were and what you were creating and what you were doing. Well, well, I I mean, this might sound crazy, but like, I always remember like if I had a like, uh, uh, an outfit on that I was really hyped on or something yeah. like I dressed a certain way I, had, I was like oh I got some new shit I would go out and skate way better like yeah. it, like I would be like Hi, I need to get a trick rocking this yeah. you know what yeah. I mean like it looks so good <laughs> I don't want to waste it yeah I like, look so good today I don't want to waste just, it outfit. yeah it was just like you were yeah. just hyped you know and I think it's like same thing for like oh you put on a new outfit and you could go get a good job or go find a girl or you know it was yeah. that kind of similar thing you put something yeah it gave you a mojo you gave, swagger, felt, felt good about yourself you know yeah. and and so that, that all was kind of all happening all at the same time. Um, and, uh, and just kind of one thing kind of would lead, lead to another. Um, but the more I focused on those things, the more I realized, oh shit, well, I need to add, or I got to finish this video part, I got to do this. And so I was always trying to find that balance between those two worlds a bit, you know? Yeah, I struggled with that for a really long time. I would, you know, and injuries helped me balance it. Basically, when I got hurt, I would focus on the company more. And when I was, when I was, you know, feeling good and I was skating, then I would f- focus on skating more and I would do as much work stuff as I had to do. Um, but very similar to you, I, I started kind of evolving that understanding for business. And obviously a few years before, because, you know, when Ed brought me on to, you know, help with Toy Machine, he was kind of focused on, you know, the creative side of, you know, the ads, t-shirts, the graphics. Um, and I was kind of, doing the video and the marketing and like, you know, kind of the team and team management and stuff. And I didn't, you know, I mean, I didn't really know that much about it, but it's easy. The guy calls you up and says, Hey, could I get some boards? It's like, how many do you need? What one, what shape do you ride? It's kind of pretty common sense. And I just started shipping packages and going to Tomietto every day to do something, you know? And yeah. I remember that, you know, that was 
kind of my first taste to business was seeing you know how the operations went it wasn't yeah. even and, and that, I, that was my my first introduction to it too yeah. when you took me to Tomietto and I saw Todd Swank and you and Ed and everybody you know and it was working, inspiring working, to see them yeah, too, it was. because they were like us they yeah. weren't like businessmen you yeah. know they were just like a skate rat too yes you know what I mean and I, I, remember, I never saw that before in my life. I remember yeah. I was like, these guys are skaters and they have like a company and there's a warehouse filled with product totally. that they're managing. I was like, yeah. wow, like, you know, as Absolutely. a kid, that blew me away. Totally. Yeah. And, and the fact that they were creating s certain parts of the product too, like screen printing the boards and screen printing the shirts and Todd had taken that on. So I felt like that was a really cool creative process that was a part of the business that made it feel more authentic to me and I was so stoked to be around it like to watch them screen and to get a board like a one-off that was a little different or to get a one-off t-shirt that was only a single color like that I was like dude this is like the best thing in the world like imagine being a kid and getting like a one-off H Street shirt or a one-off yeah. like Plan B shirt or something it would you know blind like that was kind of the equivalent but I was riding for this company and it was something that I was so into you know Ed Ed basically gave me like, hey, I'll take care of this, you take care of this. And it was like, you know, free reign to do those things. And it was such a, I got so emotionally attached to what we were doing because we we're all doing it together, you know. And, and those were super special days. And there was like probably a year and a year and a half when we were filming and it felt really good, you know. And then we kind of like got to a point where it seemed like whether we were being pitted against each other. I remember you hurt your ankle and that seemed to kind of like raise the, you know, made things a little more tense because we were both trying to film for this video and you know, you being hurt and me not being hurt, that's always frustrating watching your, and it still is when you see your, like when I get hurt now and like I'm, you know, the whole team's filming for a video and I have to see, the, I'm in the group text, I see all the tricks coming in, everyone's posting their videos over the weekends and I'm just like, man, this yeah. sucks. Like this is torture. I, Especially I, at the like, you know, beginning of your career where you're like, this is gonna oh, be the yeah. one where like, this is my breakout Absolutely. party, you know, and all that stuff. And, I can only imagine what I, I felt But I like. think even like, you know, we've kind of told that story a few times and people yeah. heard it, bits and pieces of it and stuff, but I look at it like, even without that injury, both of us were going on to do our thing. For sure. You know, you were going, you were getting ready to go off and do zero. You'd already been planting that seed and been writing yeah. it on your shirts and yeah. made that board that had it on it, I yeah. think. And, yeah, yeah. and you know, and, 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 and Toy Machine, it, it was Ed's. It was always going to be Ed's, no matter yeah. how much you built a new team or brought on new uh, visuals or anything. It was always Ed's company, you know. Yeah, and we always and, knew that. Yeah. yeah, and 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 we were both just growing, and and you know, you were headed into your path, and and I knew that at that's some a very point, very great way. At some at point, it, yeah. I was going to go on and do something else beyond that anyway, re yeah. regardless of that incident. And the funny or thing not, is, is, you know, it, yeah, and Kalis, Kalis was another person that was destined to do more, you know, than ride for Toy Machine. And a lot of people don't even know that Kalis rode for Toy Machine, yeah. you know? A lot like, of people don't even know I rode for Toy Machine, which is crazy. I'm like, really? Like, and people, like, yeah, people I mean, don't know? A lot of people do know that I did because Welcome to Hell and what, you yeah, know, what, ro what, what role yeah. it played. I still do always, I mean, even though the part kind of came out in some here and yeah, there. Yeah, like, but it was like. But I always so, like, looking back, like, cause I just always did really want to be part of that video because like yeah. I, I was a part of it, you totally. know, like we were like, we yeah. were all together at that time, you know, and yeah. then to see it like, go on and not be in it and all the success that I had you know I was like that was a part where I was kind of like oh man like you know like that it was like scary you know like I remember yeah, thinking I like it, is it is it did I do it I, I got on toy machine and I got kicked off and is it over you know like is yeah. it, it could have been at that time you yeah, know and I remember there was that brief time period between you know when you were not on toy machine anymore and before shorties was getting going I remember you know seeing you around Pacific Beach and stuff and it was like you know, kind of like, what are you going to do? I mean, yeah. obviously we all knew you had like crazy potential and that at that point y your career was like, it was taking off, you know, it was, it was a big deal. We all knew that you were going to land on your feet, but I can only imagine, you know, watching the toy machine video come out and everybody be talking about it. be like, Oh, well, I, yeah. that's not, I'm not in that, but what's next for me? And I mean, then we all know in skateboarding how like tricky it can be, you know, yeah. like our industry is pretty like you can make a couple wrong decisions and it's just like, bam, you're done, you know, like yeah. piss off the wrong person or, you know, um, uh, it, but I wasn't going to allow that to happen. No, so. no. You were, you were on fire at that time. <laughs> I wasn't going to allow that one to come And down plus there. you also, I mean, the silver lining from the toy machine, like kind of blowout was, is that you had that footage as your basis for the next part. Yeah. You know, obviously you went and did a whole bunch more stuff for the, you know, fulfill the dream, but you had some of those clips that yep. you and I filmed and, and they, you were filming them in the peak of the hype for Welcome to Hell, you know, like that triple kink at San Diego, like that one clip alone. And I think your part started off with that clip, right? Or it was like really early on in the part? 
I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. I, I, just, I think I, I do that cricket grind and then like the cops get me. I'm like, fuck the police or something like that. The most beat I was making, that cheesy ass beat. That was the first beat I ever made, I think. Like, really? one, of, one of the first beats I made on the, well, on the MPC 2000 at least. I think that was the, the first one I made. It was like so random. <laughs> so it was like off. The, the snare wasn't even timed right correctly and stuff, but like, or the hi hat, I mean. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it's the same thing. It's like one of those things, like we're saying about the, anything. You just, like, just got to do it and go for it and put it out there. Totally. And not have fear of like, who cares what anybody thinks? Like, you yeah. know, you just gotta, you have to just, if you have something in your mind that you have to get out, like, then do it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. That just, and, and that, then you'll grow from there, you know, and, and keeps going, keeps going. For sure. Keeps going. I mean, and like this, what, what I'm doing today, like I, I admit that I don't know what I'm doing. And there's a certain level of, uh, anticipation that I had, you know, just for this moment to sit and talk with you that I was pretty nervous about, but it really is because as we get older, we get more complacent. It's harder to go out and just try new things, Mm -hmm. you know, and just say, screw it and put yourself out there. Um, especially when you, you know, you know, you're going to be judged in so many different ways. Like, Oh, he talks too much or he talks this way or that way. I've thought of all of the, like, it sucks because you see the Instagrams and you see all the like things people post on YouTube and everybody can just talk about whatever they want, which is great. But at the same time, like you're trying to like do something worth something and then you know people are just shooting it down and you know but it goes back to what we said earlier yeah too. you can't a lot of people are, are feeling something negative about themselves and it makes sure. them feel better about themselves to put somebody else down Absolutely. you know and so it has less to do with you and more to do with them yeah what i've what i've tried to learn in my life is to like uh sympathize for those people or you know or, yeah. or have underst- compassion and understanding for them because you have no idea what they're going through you know it's easy to to fire back and be like well screw you you know like, totally. like that's, that's you're, the- you will look at you this or that and, and i think that's a lot of problems with our world right now is that when people don't understand something they tend to judge it and and and, and react to it in a bad way for instance our president i don't necessarily like the guy i, I don't really pay attention to politics or anything like that but everybody is going attacking him and go, look, he's fat, look, he's bald, look at this, that. What does that do for society to better themselves? You're only going down to a lower level in order to, to uh, I don't know what reason that is. Yeah, what, I mean, what? I think a lot of the things people, you know, have complaints with our presidents or the things he says and, you know, whether it be racial or women or, you know, sexist or whatever. But, I mean, obviously, I get what you're saying. It's, it's how yeah, is it I, helping? I by any means, I don't support yeah, the guy or, you know, or, I know, or I know politics in general. No, no, I, but I just think that, like, you know. How is it um, helping? Yeah. How is what and, you're doing and, helping? And, but that is going to happen regardless. So it's up to you to control your reaction to things, you know. Absolutely. You, you, you can't, you yeah, can't you be in control of, of <laughs> yeah. what you what happens to you each day but you're in control of how you react to those scenarios and that's kind of all you can worry about is the shit you can control i mean you can't really you kind of you know love the stuff i mean support the stuff you love you know can worry about the stuff you can control and kind of ignore the rest that's that's kind of where i've got especially with you know there's a lot of topics of you know Corp, the corporate entities entering skateboarding and like everyone is up in arms or the Olympics or whatever. I'm like, those things are going to happen regardless, like regardless to what you say or do. Mm-hmm. You have a choice whether you want to support them or not, but at the end of the day, it's going to, it's going to carry out. Like that's going to, it's going to happen. And you just choose what you want to support and choose what you want to focus on. And it's almost like you just ignore, ignore it. Like it doesn't exist. Like it's another, another, you know, genre of something. If you don't back it, you know, I just have always, I don't know. I feel like when I was younger, like a little more emotionally immature, I would want to point fingers to like, why is this not working or why is skateboarding changing or, you know, whatever. But then it kind of looked like I was just like bummed that, you know, the companies that I rode for, or the company that I worked for or ran wasn't making money and it. I couldn't really even complain about it. So it kind of just got more down to like, how are you helping? You know, how are you helping the situation? And I think that you know, as a leader and, you know, as leaders of our industry, we have to be a positive you know, influence in that. And, you know, we're trying to do that with social, you know, obviously I'm taking this motivational, you know, speaking sort of role with my Instagram. And I know that some people are spun out by it. They're like, dude, what does this guy think? Who does he think he is? You know, but it's for me, it's like, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm embracing my role. And my role in skateboarding is to inspire and encourage people. It's been my role since I've been a super young kid. And it's always been like in my small groups to in my town to in whatever. And, I'm just embracing it. I used to ignore it and kind of just use Instagram as like, check me out or check me, check out what I'm doing. And now I kind of feel like that's a little bit, 
I don't know, meaningless. I, I want to put something out there with meaning. And, you know, and you, like you said, you, you get judged for that. You know, you get judged for doing anything different. You're going to get judged for anything. Yeah. You know, no matter what you do, there's always going to be an opinion out there, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I just like, just keep going. Just keep on going. Well, what, <laughs> what, what motivates you right now at this stage of your life? Like I talked to you uh, last week when we were talking about connecting today and you'd said that you'd, you know, changed your diet and you were kind of getting focused on your health. And then, you know, we all saw the Instagram post like a week ago where you were just, you know, had an amazing day skating and you just seemed like really stoked on life. Like, where are you at now? What motivates you and what, what's kind of, I don't know, what, what's going on with you? Yeah, I mean, like I, like, I I always have these kind of ups and downs in life, you know, where I'll be like super on point and I'm like healthy and staying focused and my mental clarity is all there and, and you know, and then I'll, fa I'll fall off. I'll have like times where it's like, okay, now I'm like eating pizzas and, and, <laughs> and being a little bit more lazy than I normally am, which I, I'm definitely not a lazy person in general, but, um, you know, sometimes I just don't feel like I'm fully being myself. And so sometimes those scenarios weigh down on me and I guess... The, the not skateboarding thing, uh, for a while, you know, I didn't realize how much of an effect that it and was having on back me. injury? Yeah, from my back injury. And yeah. so this is an ongoing thing. Um, I don't like to talk about it too much because I feel like the more I talk about it, I feel like I, everybody starts to reach out to me like, is it okay? Like, are you good? Like, what can you do? Like this and yeah, that. Yeah, try this and, or and, try and that. And so I'm not really like searching for any answers, you know? I've just had injuries and I have a bad back injury and I'm dealing with it daily. And, but I've come to terms with what it is and, and I'm starting to work with what I have and trying to just uh, um, be healthy and, and keep a healthy mind. And I think that's an important thing because if, I'm, if I don't have my self together and my clarity and my health and, and all my thoughts in a positive uh, way, um, I don't know if that's exact words, but if, I don't, if I'm not maintaining positive thoughts and, and maintaining my body, then I'm not operating as, as my full self and then I'm not serving out my purpose as far as trying to continue to inspire as well too. And so right now I'm just like rebuilding and it's still new and I'm, and I'm not saying I'll never go a little bit down again or back up. And, yeah, you know, that's funny. When I, when I think about it, I, I get super committed. I'm like, I'm never going to eat that ever again in my life. I'm, I'm really black and white with it, but I, I, yeah, and, and cool I'm, too, I'm, I'm an all or nothing person, you know, yeah. and, and that's how I've always been. And that's why like certain aspects of my life I had to abandon because I am an all or nothing person. And yeah. some of those parts with partying and drinking and all that, like, it was gonna kill me and I know it was gonna and I had to make that conscious decision to to abandon that you know in order to to get back to me and the per the person that I am because I know that like being this like wasted dude and like talking shit and all this stuff like I know that deep down inside that's not me and yeah. like uh, one of those important things for me was like when if I die how are you going to be remembered, you know? Yeah, and your I think, legacy. It's and like I a, think a lot of times you're yeah. kind of remembered as some of your last accomplishments and stuff, you know? And, and so I didn't want my last accomplishments to be going out as a party animal and dying, you know? Like that just... Uh, yeah, it's a dark cloud over a, an amazing, yeah. amazingly bright career and, and life. And so that was a big choice for myself when I thought about that a little bit and, and seeing friends die, you know, and having friends die and that were best friends. And so... That was a big change, and I still had some ups and downs in between there, you know, and, and like I said, probably will in the future too, and I think that's all part of life because if everything was perfect all the time, it wouldn't be perfect, it would just be, you yeah. know, and so it's yeah, all that the point. yin yang balance, light, dark, sun, yeah. <laughs> moon, you know, all, all those different things. It's the, it's the beauty of the universe that this other potential aspect of life does exist but you have the choice of whether to choose that or choose this, you know, and, 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 and even as you're choosing this, this one might kind of come in and, you know, you're going back and forth, but the duality of life is beautiful. And, and I've learned to how to embrace that more, the older I get and, um, searching for like bigger meanings and, and bigger purpose uh, of things that I didn't explore as a kid as much, you know, I was so focused on skateboarding or success or, living up to this like lifestyle that I thought I had to live up to yeah. or obtaining these possessions that I thought I needed to have in order to be successful or to be desired still or whatever it is um, that we're all searching for that I, now as I'm getting older, 
I'm searching for more purpose on, on a higher level and spirituality and, and, uh, um, and do you think it comes with that less expectation to deliver what people, ex you know, what people want or? Yeah, know? of course, because it's, if you're trying to live your life to please others all the time, you're not going to please yourself. And if yeah. you're not pleasing yourself, then you have no ability to please others, you yeah. know, and that that's yeah. kind of comes back full circle. Yeah, yeah. And so the, that's the way I look at it is like, you know, I'm going to do what I can do to the best of my ability. And as long as I know that I'm doing, living my life the best possible way I can, then nothing else really matters. You know, like th those, th th those people will come and they'll say things and say what they want, but that doesn't, that doesn't do anything. Those, do those people really truly care about you or do they love you or do, do they have your best interest in mind? Probably not, you know, yeah. it's, and, and you could drive yourself crazy figuring out what is everybody else? What does he think? What, what does she think? What are they going to do? What are, you know, and, and that's just, that's just going to lead you down the path of confusion. Yeah, it seems like whenever, I mean, not whenever, but sometimes you kind of go off the grid for a little while and just kind of focus inwardly on yourself and you create art and you create these amazing things. And sometimes you pop up for air and sh share them on Instagram. But for the most part, you know, you're kind of in your zone. Do you, do you think that that's... I saw, I, saw uh, I think it was Denzel Washington that wrote something recently or said something about like being an introvert and a, what are the two words? Introvert and extra, extra, extrovert. extrovert. Yeah. <laughs> I forget words sometimes, but, um, and how he finds himself as being both. I think it was him that was talking about it, but it goes through phases of each. Yeah. But because like, that's, that's what it is. It's you need you, you time, at least I, for myself, I can't speak for anybody else, but I need my time. I need yeah. my time to develop on myself and to work on maintaining these, these, uh, this, outlook I have on life, you know, yeah. because the more you are around this, this race, this rat race, and you chasing these circles, you just keep running in circles, I feel like. And, yeah. and eventually, you, you know, you need that time to, to separate yourself ground and, and, uh, and think about things at times, you know, and, and, but too much of that is unhealthy as well, too, because then you're just trapped in your mind too much. And your you know, your thoughts are can be dangerous at times when you go too deep into things, um, especially for myself, because I feel that like, I, I try to find myself in tune with the higher energy that exists in this universe. And when people are more in tune with that, it's easy to, to get down on these, on the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah, you know? No, I like, totally why, know what you mean. Why is everything like this? Why do these people do this? Why is the world accepting this? You know, there's yeah. a lot of things that you can find yourself going down a, a, a bad path because you know that this other positivity exists and, and you're like, and you're wondering why, why, why can't they see this? Why yeah, can't they yeah. see it? And, and from what it's, I, it's a level of spirituality. One thing that I learned is that all paths can eventually lead to enlightenment. Yeah. And just because someone's not going down yours doesn't mean that they're not going to get there eventually. Yeah. But if you're trying to drag every person down your path, you're not going to get there yourself, yeah. you know? And so it's important to find, find ways to get there yourself and then to, to allow others to you give advice to your friends and you see somebody messing up, yeah, give them, get, you know, give them a little kick yeah. in the butt or whatever they need, but it's still up to them to, to get to where they need to go in their life, you know? And um, I, I'm a believer in that we live millions of lives and, and, and we are reborn and over and over and over again um, through this everlasting soul and so, there's all these levels of experience and different different levels that people maybe are multiple lives behind where you're at in your life or you know and 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 so it, that's kind of my belief how because I've been through so much shit stuff and seen so many things and and had these so many weird experiences and epiphanies and uh, all these things that like make me think that it can't be just what this one life this one existence this one experience it has to be more because i just feel like there's so much more that i have inside me that i feel and see and experience um i think that's often hard for creatives to have that like that understanding and that that you know feeling of mortality because they feel like they have so much to give you know and i think that's probably pretty common like i saw this documentary on david bowie and it was kind of seemingly similar you know what i mean he just basically wanted to continue to create until he was gone you yeah. know and I can I can relate to that. So um, to to kind of wrap this up, like what what's next for you? Like what what is it that you know you want to do next? 
with yourself? I mean, that we all saw the skate posts. Is there skating to be seen? I want to skate more for sure. Yeah, I definitely like, I, although my disc is still slipped in my back and, and I'm not going to get surgery, I feel like I'm like, the more healthy I am and the more I focus on it and the more I continue to build my core strength, I'm never going to be once what I once was. Yeah, but, but people I just still, want to see But skate. I still think I'm going to be able to go out and film some tricks, you know, and yeah. have fun doing it. And I, and I really do want to do that. That's something that, like, I don't want to make any, like, 100% claims, claims or c commitments yeah, or anything like that. whether it's two, five, whatever, but, string them together, line, cruising, whatever. But yeah, for myself and for what I felt just from that one day of getting out and skating and connecting with... Um, people that were 50 years old plus ripping and, yeah. and just seeing that fire in their eyes and like connecting with them, I was just like, wow. Like, because I was going through just like, literally this is two weeks ago, you know, and I was like in a dark place. I really was. I was like, really like too many thoughts. Like what I yeah. said before, it gets unhealthy to like be too in your own world and think about too much stuff because I did start to feel some of those, um, things weigh down on me you know I was thinking about like business and thinking about my future and and art and skateboarding and like you know like what's the right thing I'm supposed to be doing and I just it was such a cloud of all these thoughts that like I was about to lose it and I just was like I got to get out of here I got to get out of this house I got my board just didn't drive I just left the car got, got on my board and walked down this hill down on my streets and just started cruising cruising down sunset and it was like boom like I was like I felt like my DNA rebuilding itself throughout wow. my body. It was like, like this power and energy. And I'm like skating down the street and then some skaters driving, Moscow, I was like, what up? And like, you know, all, all, and it was just like, I just was like, wow, okay. Like that's the freedom that like nothing else in this world has ever given me or ever will give me. Like, is that's that amazing. just riding, you know, yeah. and just rolling and just being out in the sun and just, and moving at a different uh, speed than anybody else. You know, it's the like cars are driving fast or they're stopping at a light. People are walking slow. You know, bikes are kind of steady and doing their thing. You know, the board, you're just like here, you're up here, up down here, this, there. You know, it's like you're navigating in a completely different uh, motion than anybody else out there. And, and I don't know, for whatever reason, that was so great. And from there, ended up at this full pipe with Scott Oster and Jesse Martinez and Eric Dressen. It's like, you know, I'm just like, wow, like, this is amazing. <laughs> you That's know? awesome, man. All it's right, been well, good fuel ever since then. <laughs> well, thank you, dude. I, I really appreciate it. I love your energy. I've you know, said it a million times. Thank you for everything. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the show, Jamie. Yeah, my it's an honor. Right. We worked through a couple of the, the beginning kinks here, you know, on the guinea pig here, you know what I'm saying? But Chad, Chad, is, <laughs> Chad was kind enough to be a guinea pig. Thank you for watching the first episode. We hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon.